So we are in session 21 today. We'll cover C Sharp 3.0 features in this session, which covers uh, implicitly typed local variables, an overview with an example, and uh, also we'll look into the, the restrictions and some constraints on top of them. And we'll see extension methods, which is one of the very rich feature introduced in 3.0, how to declare them, import them, and invoke them. And uh, we'll see lambda expressions, which is a very, very strong feature again. And uh, lambda expressions with expression versus uh, statement body. We'll deep dive into lambda expressions in this session. And also explicit versus implicit type declaration of lambda expressions, we'll see. And many other uh, small topics uh, to start with. So let's kick off 21. So three or all features are uh, very interesting features are added up uh, in 3.0 and uh, definitely uh, if you uh, pay a little close attention then uh, you will really love those features uh, although they are little um, going to be a little complicated uh, but I will try to keep it as simple as possible uh, and um, once you know the uh, concepts overview then you can actually research more in that area uh, and explore it more so the, again so these cons these topics are again cannot be ignored another thing is uh, because the forthcoming versions of the um, language uh, are strictly relied more mostly relied on these fundamental concepts which were which was introduced in 2.0 and 3.0 okay so the thing is, you cannot ignore them, and that's the reason I'm covering those topics uh, as part of our training session. Okay, so uh, the first thing, we'll go with the overview. So C Sharp Orcas is the uh, code word uh, for uh, C Sharp 3.0. Uh, what is a code word? Again, probably uh, uh, most of you may know what is a code word. So when Microsoft starts uh, building or developing the next version, um, when the development team start working on the uh, given release, you normally don't. Uh, Microsoft never comes with a, a predefined date when it's going to release. So it will be uh, starting in the inception phase. Uh, what are the features that you're going to add up? Uh, so there's a lot of thought process goes behind it, and even the feedbacks from the consumers, uh, uh, the developer community. So based on all lot of things, they will be. Uh, laying out what are the features that they're going to add as a next enhancement. So, uh, and before they add it and uh, make it as a final release, there is something called beta versions, right? So before the beta again, uh, before the beta again, they don't know which version they want to go to name it. So for for the development stage, they're going to give that um, give that uh, specific uh, product uh, a code name. So if you see every product that Microsoft has or probably with any other uh, uh, products that you see, especially with IT related, they comes with a, a code word. So if you see uh, Wikipedia and open it, uh, open and see, look out for uh, the various versions, every version will have a code word. And similarly, C Sharp 3.0 has a code word uh, called C Sharp Orcas. Okay, so they introduced several new features, uh, and these are very, very interesting features. You will definitely love it. Um, so if you're having something else in your mind, uh, take a break and uh, pay some little attention here. So it's going to be pretty interesting, and if you miss a, any one statement that I'm going to talk, uh, you might uh, not understand the remaining concept that I'm going to uh, cover. So um, be patient and uh, attentive. So this is the first uh, topic, so there are several to out of the several topics, the first topic is the implicitly typed local variables. We did see a small part of it in the previous uh, um, uh, 2.0 version, wherein uh, the data types that you define, uh, you no, no longer need to be uh, specified uh, with the actual data type. So if you just uh, type a variable name using a var keyword, and based on the value that you assign to that um, variable, the type is implicitly 
determine. So that's all about implicitly typed local variables. So we'll see uh, with the demo and other things. Uh, so we'll just list out the rough, uh, what are the topics that we're going to see as part of 3.0. Three, um, three uh, that's number one is uh, implicitly typed local variables and next comes with the extension methods so these are very very strong feature um, and lambda expressions so these are very very strong features again so these are the next level of uh, um, the uh, the previous session we did talk about the anonymous methods so the anonymous methods the next level is the lambda expression it's similar to an anonymous methods where in the methods without a name uh, but they have parameters and also the body. The next is the object in, uh, initializers, collection initializers, anonymous types. So we have seen anonymous methods and implicitly typed arrays. This is another interesting feature. Query expressions. Query expressions are more uh, uh, going forward becomes the um, the fundamentals for uh, links which is a uh, language integrated queries. So if you see the uh, lambda expressions, uh, the query expressions are, uh, and also the next one is the expression trees. So these are all uh, the internals of uh, how the link is working. And okay, but of course there are some limitations, uh, but we will see all of that uh, when we come to links, okay? So, so these are the, some of the fundamentals which are relied on the link. So will cover these fundamentals uh, today. Okay, so if this is a very simple thing. Implicitly type local variables. Um, in an implicitly type local variable declaration, the type of the local variable being declared is inferred. This is another words called, in other words, uh, uh, referred to as a type inference. Uh, and uh, so, so if you don't specify the data type, uh, uh, you can actually create a some variable with some data type which you don't know until you have the value uh, assigned to it. So in such cases you can actually make use of the var keyword. The keyword used for this is the var. Okay, so this is a, uh, if it is the first time you're looking at this var keyword then uh, take a close look at this. You will be using this um, more often uh, we, uh, when you talk, when you're going to do the link programming, um, writing link queries and other things. So var is a very fundamental uh, type there. So var indicates that it's a very uh, it's an unknown data type when you declare it. So if you see, uh, if you see the legacy way, explicitly type local variables when you say how you declare a variable in a so far. So it's pretty much you specify a data type int and provide a variable name and then a value. You can initialize it or at the uh, when you declare it. Otherwise, the values can be assigned anywhere in the program within their scope, right? Similarly, uh, for string here, we have a string data type and object, uh, so the variable name and a value. Similarly, for double and for arrays also, we do the same way. Uh, we have an int data type is specified uh, along with the square brackets uh, and the variable name, which indicates that it's an array of integers, and you can initialize the, them directly. Of course, there are very um, there are so many other shortcuts we saw when we do the arrays. So again, so for dictionaries, again, you specify this is a generic types. Uh, dictionary of int comma string that means it takes uh, uh, when you have this uh, dictionary of uh, int string this variable actually stores the values of int as a key and uh, value as a string so, so that's a key value pair right so dictionary we did talk about this when we uh, did the uh, collections and similarly bool uh, the boolean you can have it and the c uh, character so so the common thing in all these um, explicitly typed local variables, right? So in other words, the, so far we have seen the explicitly typed local variable. That means you're explicitly specifying which data type that your variable is going to hold, okay? So this is a variable and this is a data type, right? So you're perfectly clear with what um, a data type and a variable means and the value, right? So this is a distinction you should be knowing by now. 
and uh, yes so we'll get into the next um, with the console or right line it's a little bit different in, the, in this case I'm trying to show a different flavor of how to write uh, a right line without a for each loop here okay yes now we'll see the implicitly typed local variables so the, in this case none of the types are specified right here when the when you declare the um, variable the whole set of variables nowhere we specified what data type you're going to pick okay it's, if you look at this closely it might resemble just like an object right so in when you have an object um, keyword uh, as a data type and do the variable name like this and, uh, and assign a value to it so it's also same way just like a var right but var and uh, objects are completely two different things. Uh, object is uh, a base uh, type or a base class for all the data types uh, in dot and especially for reference types, not for the value types. So when you do an object, my int is equal to 15, um, the value assigned to the object variable becomes a value type. That means there's a boxing take uh, taken place. So when it deal, deal with objects, the boxing and unboxing takes place. Whereas when it when you make it var, there is no boxing and unboxing concept at all. So so how it happens is uh, how the compiler knows that what is the value that you're going to add. In this case, uh, once you look at the var as an implicitly typed local variables, um, uh, you can based on the value that is assigned to that variable, the type is inferred. So it's going to be, uh, uh, in this case, um, var my int. If you just declare and leave it uh, without using uh, assigning, which is not possible when, you, when you're dealing with var, var uh, makes uh, um, mandatory that you need to initialize with some value. So based on the value that you as assign to this var, this type is going to be inferred. So based on here, in this case, uh, 15 so if 15 is an integer so my int becomes this variable becomes integer so going forward on it will take only int values so again the time safety is not compromised so where on in other words you can now read where as a variable or a variant a variant is a very a, a variant is similar in um, uh, if you look at the uh, the vb6.o language, uh, there is a data type called variant, which means uh, it can take any data type uh, in the applications. Even if you look at the JavaScript, JavaScript also has only one and only one data type called var. Uh, you, you might be surprised to know that JavaScript has only one data type and it has only var. So anything you want, you declare with var, nothing else. So here is here it's not the case. So although it's var uh, when you declare, but based on the value that you initialize, its type is inferred implicitly. So you really don't need to worry about what data type this value really need to be. So if you take a different dimension to how how you, why this is important, um, this leaves a more uh, scope for the programmers to deal with the business data rather than the uh, data types that you really worry about day to day. Okay, so I have so and so business data, so you, you're writing application uh, to deal with the data in general, right? So you really need to care about the business data rather than the data type, in other words. Uh, but still, is how you will maintain the type safety. So that's the idea behind having a var data type, uh, and you really need not worry about what is the what is the data type that you're going to assign. So in this case, int, string, these are all very simple. Uh, in case of uh, when you deal with the complex uh, um, types like a collections or general collections, then th this will be very useful. Especially this uh, is going to be the a fundamental. Um, keyword that we'll be using when you will make use of link in C sharp or in dot net and, uh, and also yeah we'll see more of its usage uh, going forward okay so all these data types are initialized with or uh, when you declare and based on the value that but when you assign a value in this case uh, uh, for integer uh, for array 
you need to specify the data type when you actually initialize it. Of course, again, there is a type inference for this also, right? In uh, arrays declaration, we can skip uh, the um, this part of it also. It can actually infer the data type based on the values that you pass in the collection, right? So that's we have seen when it, when we did the arrays. Uh, if you want to refer, uh, you can refer the old code examples that we have done. And similarly for the dictionary, uh, when you uh, create uh, initialize it, uh, the, uh, when you create an instance of it, you need to specify the data type. So based on the values that you assign, uh, the type is inferred. And uh, yes, so the other thing that I wanted to uh, show you here is the uh, the new format in which the right line is doing. So in this case, in this case, uh, I'm trying to get all the um, values of the variables out in a single line. Uh, in other words, uh, in this case, if you see the placeholders, you are very familiar with the placeholders here. Uh, with the zero is indexer one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And uh, after the comma, it is something called a new object array, right? So this is an object array that I'm passing. And uh, within the array, I'm actually passing these values, right? So I'm, I could, in other words, I used to pass the same um, values uh, as just like a comma separated values uh, following the format, right? So in this case, we are actually passing a uh, collection of values to it. So all these values, of course, are strings because I'm just making making sure they emit string by using the get type. So um, so once I have this uh, variable declared and I send the values, I'm trying to get the type of the respect to variables to see what is the actual type that is um, that the compiler inferred to. Uh, so again, that's the reason why I'm trying to demonstrate this. Okay, so if you run this code, both will emit the same output. In this case, uh, we are more interested on the right hand side, which is the implicitly typed local variables. So although I did not specify the type at the runtime, so the respective variables will pick the, in this case, uh, my int uh, became a system.in32 and uh, my string became system.string and double in32 array of in32 and the general collection dictionary and it's two represents the uh, two parameter um, to a key and key value pair uh, data types that is different to I just truncated this one um, for the space uh, uh, issue otherwise uh, when we run it we'll see the full form of it it will show you the respective two data types uh, uh, that it's taking the key and key and key data type and the value data type and again system dot boolean system dot cat so it's pretty straightforward and clean so we'll see this demo and again, this code will be available to you after this session um, in the SkyDrive, okay? It's the same piece of code in the first part of it. Uh, it's all uh, explicitly typed. So you're going to explicitly say that this is the data type that you're going to make use of it. And the, in the second case, um, it's all completely implicitly typed local variables, okay? If you take a look at the IntelliSense, how it's going to work, right? At the runtime, or at the design time, it will be really interesting. Okay, so it's pretty good. Um, so implicitly local um, variables are type is inferred to the respective data type. There's no difference between the uh, the way you declare in the explicitly or the way you declare in implicitly. So the both emit type safe uh, data types. Okay, so that uh, takes care of the uh, uh, implicitly type local variables and in the uh, okay these are some of the restrictions we want to see so which some of them which we already seen the the declarator must include an initializer so what this means is when you have a declaration like this um, it's going to fail with the compile time error uh, saying that it, it must have some initialized value which we have not seen so far right if I just declare a value like this so that becomes a compile time error because we have seen that um, based on the value that you're assigned it's need to infer the data type so you cannot actually have some var and some point in the day some point of the code you can you can't do that so that's the uh, 
constraint on top of the implicitly type local variable. That's number one. The initializer must be an expression. So in this case, um, um, in this case, uh, we are try directly assigning an array of uh, values to it. So in this case, uh, it cannot be taken directly. So it cannot can, uh, the initializer must be an expression. Expression, in other words, uh, can be related to a uh, a function that returns a value out. Okay, that function again it can be an anonymous function, right? So uh, it can be a function. So some expression um, which we're going to see in, uh, it down the line, uh, it could be a link expression. In other words, uh, it can be a link expression which returns some um, data type as a written uh, written value, uh, or you can straight away uh, give some direct value like a var is equal to some value. It should be some meaningful value, but it cannot be a direct initialization like this array. So in, um, implicitly type local variable, um, so it says it cannot initialize an implicitly lo type local variable with an array initializer, so it cannot be taken. It should be an expression. And the initializer uh, expression cannot be the null type. Again, you cannot actually assign a null directly because null makes uh, again very generic because null can be of null, null is the uh, default value that you can um, make a reference type assigned to right so we did see even the value types also whereas the nullable types nullable types can also take a null value so if with the null you cannot actually determine which data type you are referring to right so that's the default value for a reference type and also for nullable value types so hence uh, null cannot be taken as a initializer and if the local variable declaration includes multiple declarators and the initializers must all have the same type and what this means is that uh, when you declare the uh, the value uh, uh, your variable and assign a value to it it must have the same type assigned or uh, throughout the program you cannot actually make it uh, declare an initialize with the integer and then followed by a string. It's not possible, which we have seen, right? Yeah, so most of the demo part is done. Prior to the slide. Now comes the extension methods. The This is again a very interesting one, as I said. So um, pay a little close attention. This is going to be a fun. Uh, extension methods. Extension methods are static methods that can be invoked using instance method syntax. Okay, so this is a little contradiction, right? If you remember what is a static methods. Static methods are always associated to the name of a class or the class name, right? They are associated to the class declaration, not the instance of the class. Whereas instance of what are the members are referred to in instance members are we're going to be concrete members which are associated to the uh, the instance uh, like instance methods um, so there's a slight difference now in this case this is going to break a couple of rules number one the extension methods must be or can be only static methods okay um, you know as I said like for example if you have an in uh, into data type system dot int 32 is a data type and system.int32, you want to add your own method to it. Say for example, uh, in the in the example that I'm going to show, say it says uh, uh, the data type, um, for example, uh, you want to convert to a string. Uh, two string is already there, but two string normally gives you the data type, but uh, uh, not the value if I'm not wrong. So if you want to get the uh, value of the integer as a string, for example, you assign one, uh, and you return when you say uh, two number or two string and you want to see one in English O N E one and similarly you want to have if you assign 200, uh, 205 and you return a value out as a 205 how good is that so that's not available as part of the predefined data types right so if you want to have such kind of methods uh, how you do so using extension methods, you can actually. So, so in here the case here is that the the uh, the type is a uh, base type, primitive type, but 
you can add extensions to that without uh, even inheriting to that integer data type because you cannot inherit a structure and also uh, since you cannot inherit it you cannot extend it right in, as simple as that so int is a value type and uh, uh, it doesn't participate in an inheritance hierarchy it's a primitive type unlike any objects so for such kind of scenarios you can actually add additional methods uh, using extension methods and how you do that um, by declaring we'll see and extension methods are static methods that can be invoked using instance methods syntax if you see how you access an instance methods it's uh, through the instance of that uh, type dot method as simple as that right when you see the uh, static members um, we always access them using the uh, the name of the class rather than the instance term. So although extension methods are static, you can actually invoke them uh, just like an uh, instance type. Okay, so that's the speciality of an extension methods. Uh, in effect, extension methods uh, take it, uh, make it possible to extend existing types and construct types with additional methods. So it's pretty interesting, right? So extension methods are less discoverable and more limited in functionality than instance methods, but Okay, so since you write the extension methods outside the uh, the predefined me methods, uh, predefined data types, and you don't normally do any inheritance hierarchy or you do override, it. so they are having limitations. There are very limitations, like for example, if you if the base uh, if the of uh, the class is already having a method, and you want to have the same name in the method. Uh, and uh, you want to make use of that uh, if for example you have uh, say two string two string two string is all, already there for int data type right so wh uh, whatever uh, the object has uh, built with two string implementation that will proceed over what you have written as an extension method so in that case if you write the same method name uh, and call that so the the base method, whatever the uh, data type has, the implementation that will be uh, invoked rather than your extension methods. So extension methods will, not, will be ignored. So there are a lot of limitations. So it's you need to be considered very carefully. You need to evaluate uh, what is an exact name you want to give to the extension method, and so that it's unique, uh, 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 unique going forward in the future. So, so you need to pay some special attention in the naming the extension methods. Okay, the extension members of uh, other kinds such as properties, events, and uh, operators are being considered but are not supported right now. Okay, so you can have extension methods uh, uh, only but not properties or events or operators. Okay, um, so just, just like our, um, our delegates uh, extension methods, there are stepwise implementation. Uh, the step number one, uh, it's actually pretty easy, not too complicated. Uh, declaring an extension method. So how do you declare an extension method? Number one. Okay, extension methods are declared by specifying the keyword this. If you remember, this keyword is also used when we did uh, indexing, right? Indexers uh, for collections. When we created an indexer for a collection, uh, indexes are pretty much like a properties with the getters and setters, uh, except they accept a, a parameter. Uh, by, by the keyword called this, right? And in uh, general, this refers to the current instance of the class. So in this case, uh, you create a method with a parameter, okay? Your, uh, methods are declared with specifying a keyword this as a modifier on the first parameter of the method. So if the extension method has uh, two parameters and it must have this, one of the parameter, uh, the first parameter should be um, decorated with the modifier uh, this keyword. Okay, extension methods can only be declared in static classes because they're static members and they must be in static classes. So this is a typical uh, way how you declare. So you will have a namespace of your own, for example here in this case, my custom ex extensions and within that I have a public uh, class. Again, remember, uh, since these need to be uh, accessed without creating instance of the um, class, they need to be static. 
So you remember when we did use the static classes, static classes got introduced in 2.0 and uh, this is way, uh, this is how it is extended in 3.0. So the uh, static classes were introduced uh, to facilitate to not to uh, access the members without creating the instance of the class, right? So uh, static class, uh, you must have a static class because a, a compiler cannot create an instance of your class and then associate the method to the given type, right? How it's going to do its internal magic, but we really don't care how it is going to do internally. Uh, to have to declare a, an extension method, it must be a, uh, in a static class because we just discussed why, right? And um, also the members must be static. Okay, so this is the member, both are static. That's a very, very important thing to remember when we talk about extension methods. And the third thing to make the method as an extension method is the this keyword in the first parameter. So in this case, uh, the public st uh, static int to integer is a method and uh, this string str. It's just going to take a string and again, if you see this, this and followed by the data type, right? So int is a return type, just like a normal method, right? Int is a return type. And in this case, uh, for the first parameter will be the data type to which you want to associate this extension method. So that's the key thing here. In this case, when I said uh, string str, that means I'm interested in adding this extension method to it data type called string. You got it? So when that's where uh, this represents. So the, when you, in this case what happens is uh, when you um, make this um, uh, class available in your pro, in your project uh, and make uh, declare a data type called string then str will have a new method called to integer. We'll see that. Okay, so that's what it means. So the, uh, the data type followed by this keyword uh, will be the data type to which this method, this extension method is added to. So that's a key thing to remember again. So in this case, if you have any custom um, classes like a person, for example, or a car or an automobile, if you want to add a custom method, uh, then in that case, this data type will be the respective person or car or automobile. So that's what you need to uh, consider. Okay, so that's the first step and uh, all, everything is taken care of. Okay, so the first thing is the, it should be in a class, static class and it should be a static method and it should have the first uh, first parameter with uh, this keyword. Oh, okay, and then importing the extension methods. How do you import the extension methods? So pretty simple. Extension methods are imported through using the namespace directives. What is the using namespace directive? It is nothing but using statement. Um, so if you see this, in other words, referred to as an using namespace. It's the same thing that we have seen so far, right? So all we care about the namespace where this extension method exists. Okay, so just have to include that namespace into your program and you're all done. So rest is taken care of. And now extension method invocation. How do you invoke it? Extension methods are invoked just as an instance method. How? What does it mean? So in this case, if you see, once you do this uh, in, uh, using statement and include, include the namespace which contains the extension method and henceforth in your code, whenever you declare a string variable, uh, my string, the my string has a two integer extension method added up. So it's just like you're going to invoke this two string method, your extension method, just like an instance method, because we are actually make is it's made part it's made available as part of the instance variable. So if you know this is the data type and this is the instance variable, and instance variable dot your extension method. How cool is that? And in this case, what it is trying to do is it's actually converting. Uh, this implementation is nothing but it's doing uh, converting the, oops, converting the uh, string to an integer in 32 dot using the in 32 
dot parse right okay so we are getting the int conversion done using the two in other words we just had a parser implementation here okay as I mentioned you can do the same thing for an int data type and uh, um, um, have an extension method called uh, um, in words or get in get words then just write your implementation say whenever you say one two three four to the to the int value and say get words then it might you can write an implementation to write uh, 1234 you can write it in words that will be one interesting thing probably that could be a good assignment if you want to take it forward Okay, so I think we are not done yet. So where is the demo? So we need to do the demo, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so and another thing, uh, we were talking about the extension methods. Excellent. So I'm going to uncomment this code and another for to, for this demonstration. Actually, I added the another project called my extensions my custom extensions wherein I am having my custom method this is just to uh, show you that this can be completely out of the assembly where you're using it and it of course it can be part of the same assembly again so if you write extension methods so this is one of the constraint or one of the uh, best practice that you need to keep in mind that the name that you're going to make use of it number one is should be unique. Uh, you can actually name it uh, um, very generic uh, or specific name to uh, that maps to your project name, something like that, so that no one else uh, copies. Because uh, what uh, down the line, if you are you're in uh, C sharp four dot or five dot o and Microsoft uh, added uh, two integer to a string data type by default, right? What will happen to your extension method? Your extension method will never be called. So to avoid such situations, uh, uh, you need to make your extension method unique. So such method doesn't should not exist in the uh, in the base type, which is in this case string. So that's you need to ensure for that. You need to make sure that the name is going to be unique, and also uh, you need to it's always recommended to make your extension uh, methods as a separate assembly, so that this can be reused uh, into multiple other projects, and also it can be distributed also. Uh, consider in this case uh, is your algorithm is going to be very complex um, and you want to make use of this in multiple other projects then it's always good to make it as a separate assembly uh, in other words separate project and this is a library this is a library project this is not a console it is a custom class library right so this cannot run on its own someone have to refer this and make use of it okay so same thing we have done here so I have the extension class here and within this um, class this is a static class and I have uh, the extension method to integer uh, with this keyword for this keyword for string data type so I'm receiving str so whatever the uh, instance uh, using this I'm going to get that value here and I'm going to play around whatever I want to do in this case uh, I'm converting that string to an integer and in the second case uh, I have another um, extension method here which is called is number and it is written in boolean and it's of course as a, is a static method uh, static uh, method and of course it must be public you can't have a private here uh, protected it must be public and uh, of course using the this keyword of, uh, and applicable to this data type which is string right and in this case i'm just uh, doing the same uh, logic uh, using the in 30 the try pass um, to uh, of course we I have uh, I think I have gone through this uh, try paths example uh, in one of the exercises and uh, just to recap again um, just to try try pass will not throw you an exception whereas paths will throw an exception if the if the value that you're receiving is a is not a number in this case uh, in 32 dot paths uh, if you pass a value called uh, some string say O N E one instead of number one, um, it's going to break. Whereas try pass is not going to break. It's going to uh, take two arguments. Number one is um, the value that you want to convert, or the the value that you want to pass. In this case, it's string, and as an out, an out 
parameter. So if you see this is an out parameter just like uh, a SQL Server stored prog is specified as an out parameter similarly in C sharp uh, this is in other words called as a reference by ref in vb.net and out in C sharp. So again uh, people might ask you what is an out or uh, parameter. So out parameter indicates that the value that you're passing in will be written out. In other words, in this case the i is passed as an parameter to it. Uh, in other case the value of this i is going to be uh, initialized uh, in the try pass implementation and it returns out. Okay, in this case so uh, in this case I'm not making use of the return value i uh, I'm interested in to seeing if try pass is successful or not. So in 32 try pass what it does, what it's going to do is it's going to take the string, convert that into it will actually try converting the string to an in, integer because it's in 32 uh, in 32 and then uh, if it is successful then it's going to put that uh, converted value into i. So after this I can actually access that i value. So before this, there is no value assigned. It is going to be default zero, and after this, if I look at the value, it's going to get the uh, converted value. Uh, have it, uh, have it try at home and see. Um, in other words, we can actually rewrite this in a different way to see it now itself. Uh, we can do that. So in this case, what happens is if that conversion is successful, the try pass returns a boolean. If you see, it returns a boolean. So that's what we are returning out. So this indicates that if the given value is successfully um, passed to a number, then it's a number. Otherwise, no. So try pass is going to say that, but it's never going to throw an exception. Okay. So that's a, um, a little addition to extension method. This is again not specific to extension method. This is specific to the language. Okay. So we will um, make use of this extension method and then again then step into the uh, details. Right. Uh, we can do that exercise also now. Okay, so in this case, I'm uh, making use of the uh, extension methods. How? By importing it, or in other words, uh, using the namespace. And before this, because if you see, this is a separate project, and this is a separate project. In order to use the uh, my customs namespace, I must actually add a reference to that project, right? And uh, I did add the reference of my custom extensions here by using the add reference and picking the project. So since I have this project here, it's available in the my in the projects tab. If at all if at all you receive this as a, uh, an extent, uh, as a distributed DLL, then you will need to browse and locate your DLL and then add it, add it as a reference. Okay? So we did cover that basics uh, in the past. Okay, so once you add the using statements, all the custom um, all the oops, namespace doesn't go okay that's fine extension methods so all the extension methods that are available in that given namespace will be imported into your code just like uh, once you do the using statements all the classes that are available within that namespace are accessible within your code block so similarly uh, all those extension methods are accessible and they will apply implicitly you don't have to really do anything more than just using the respective namespace Okay, and in this case, I'm just going to declare the standard uh, uh, string and access the two integer. And uh, how far? Let me take it uh, to the code definition and see. Is it landing? Yes. Is it? This is landing exactly where I'm intended because this two integer is not available to a standard string. We, we added this as an extension method, so that's really cool, right? And similarly, um, uh, in this case, uh, yes, I'm also making use of the is number to check whether the given number is a number or not and we are writing that uh, value out. Okay, so we'll just run this uh, happy path and then we'll see some of the additions that we wanted to see. It's cool. Uh, it did successfully um, convert it to integer although this is a string and we got the value as 1, 2, 3, 4 and here also it says true. Okay, so that's, um, that's what uh, these two additions are doing. Okay, so now in this case, right, it's two integer, if you see try pass was actually, uh, it's not using the try pass, it's actually using pass. So what will happen uh, if I pass a number uh, or name or something, say one, okay. 
there you go so the parse is going to throw an exception saying it can, uh, if the uh, input string was not in the correct format that's why it's a format exception because your, uh, the parser is actually expecting a, a number in the form of a string but here o n e is not a number so that's how it's breaking right and uh, we will take this uh, out because this is going to fail anyway right so we're going to take this to code and we'll see is number it did pass so it, it didn't break it did pass and it says false so the ONE is not a number so that's a clear distinction between the try and try pass and and of course there is a lot more for extension methods uh, with respect to the constraints and restrictions uh, you can uh, I recommend you to read more if you're really interested in okay and the next topic comes the lambda expression so this is a very very cool one and uh, could be a little complicated but uh, I'll try to keep it simple uh, we'll start with the code example in the first slide and then we'll go and talk about other uh, there are a ton of uh, exceptions or constraints apply to lambda expressions and uh, sometimes it goes a little weird uh, but um, if you know uh, what each of the uh, portion of your expression doing then it will be going to be really fun okay so what's let's see since in we have uh, seen that 2.0 introduce the anonymous methods which allow code blocks to be written in line so we did see how can we do an anonymous methods we'll see again today uh, we'll do a comparison between uh, uh, anonymous and lambda expressions um, side by side so we have written uh, we were able to write the uh, inline functions without the name just the parameters and the block on the body and make use of the anonymous methods um, where the of course it's not they all refer to the delegates that's the fundamental thing if, it, if you remember the delegates was one of the very fundamental topic that we discussed long back uh, and uh, anonymous methods adds uh, adds on top of the delegates and again the lambda expressions are also uh, depends on the delegates but going forward we actually don't see the delegate as a keyword but delegate becomes an invisible uh, uh, like an uh, inference uh, it's going to be inferred like just like a var types so you know no more we're going to make use of the delegate as a keyword but behind the scenes uh, its delegate is one it's actually making things work um, so uh, it's a kind of a slight shift in the uh, in the coding so we have uh, introduced the keywords that are no more visible but they are used in internally so that's the kind of uh, um, shift we're going to take uh, going forward okay and it's just similar like we have seen methods and we don't see method names now so there are there are unnamed methods now they are anonymous methods and again so um, if you really want to uh, write in a normal way you can always do it you can always have a name methods and pass it and assign it to the delegate and you can do it and wherever wherever possible you can actually make use of anonymous methods it's all like con how concise you can make your code and how fast you can write it in other words okay so um, the the limitations of the lambda uh, anonymous methods right while anonymous methods provide much of the expressive power of functional programming languages which we have seen uh, discussed an overview but not seen what the functional programming language is all about if you're interested you can actually explore on the functional programming language f sharp is one of the one of them in the dotnet family and there are of course other uh, functional programming languages available uh, outside the dotnet uh, you, you can actually take a look at them uh, probably if you have time and interest uh, the anonymous method syntax is rather um, verbose uh, verbose or imperative in nature uh, in sense that it is um, good enough but the uh, thing is it can be much more concise um, so that's what the lambda exp expression is going to bring in the lambda expressions more um, provide a more concise functional syntax for writing anonymous methods and of course the, these uh, are available in the um, uh, in, I think in C++ as well in a different way um, but yeah if you wanted there are some articles which which can be compared with the C++ as well um, 
but in .NET, when it, when you come to .NET, uh, whatever is introduced as a concept, they are all type safe, they are object oriented, and they are uh, they are always scalable. So that's the um, richness uh, adds when it comes to .NET than the other languages. Okay, so here the side by side comparison of an anonymous method versus lambda. Uh, again, well, pay a little close attention to the keywords like the anonymous method and lambda expression. So this is an expression, whereas this is a method. So there's a big difference between those two. We'll see the difference uh, going forward. So uh, in an anonymous methods, uh, we have seen we have a delegate on top okay so we have a delegate on the top and uh, we create an instance of the delegate and uh, associate a method earlier we have seen a method a method can be a static method or an instance method of a given instance variable right so in anonymous methods we have got rid of uh, writing a separate method for it we have actually uh, written the method in line for the delegate where in this case with the delegate uh, with the no parameters or oh, some method that associated to the delegate without a parameter and a body that means the statement and in the second example it's a with the parameter and with the body so it is actually two types of uh, uh, delegates we were actually dealing with uh, one is with the with uh, without a parameter which is this and the other one is uh, with parameter so for the respective ones, we have uh, added uh, anonymous methods and we made use of it, which is pretty straightforward, right? So how best again you can reduce it? We'll see that here. So when you talk about the lambda expressions, so this is one form of it actually, there, um, and this is a fundamental form again. In this case, there is no delegate keyword. Delegate keyword is gone, but you have a delegate. Of course, you have a delegate but uh, the delegate keyword is completely gone okay so this part is gone this part is gone so we, what, what remains is the open brackets and close brackets for the method and the new operator the operator this one is referred to as a lambda operator which is, is equal to or greater than symbol uh, in mathematics, probably it's referred to as an implies. Uh, in equations, uh, you're going to make use of it. Uh, and when when you see this symbol, okay, this is the identifier for you to call that there is a lambda expression used. Okay, so this is a special symbol that you want to memorize, uh, completely memorize it. Uh, this lambda operator. Uh, whenever you see this, this code is actually making use of lambda expression. Okay, um, so that's the key thing to note. So in this case, there is no delegate keyword. What I'm saying is equal to, uh, I'm just actually specifying the method directly. There is no method name again. So the there is no name to the method, and also I'm not saying it's a delegate. I'm just straight away assigning some method. This is an expression. If you see, if you take a close look, this is just like an expression, right? It's just uh, like a uh, uh, control uh, where when I write uh, console or write line, I'm just putting some expression saying, uh, uh, okay, curly brace lights zero, comma, do this, do that, and then um, just adding some parameters to it and running it. So that whole thing is actually even I we made use of it uh, when we do the date um, date formats. What I'm doing there is I'm just specifying uh, two small d's and capital d's. That's it. So nothing else, right? It's a, it's an expression, and similarly you. Going forward, we will see the regular expressions as well. So regular expressions are also very strong. Um, you can actually make use of uh, it uh, in several ways. Actually, we will see in several examples when we um, when we talk about the web-based applications, especially. So it's going to be very very useful um, for validating the user inputs uh, in a very different ways. So similarly, the expression here is a code. Within the code, we're actually doing some expression, and this expression has a complete meaning to it, and you need to pay attention. In the next slide, we're going to pay more close attention to what is uh, this expression is doing, and what are the other flavors you can uh, have to it. 
So although it might look like a confused statement here, uh, what is this open open brackets, close brackets, what is the symbol, what is ugly brackets open and written, written some statement, it's like, you know, uh, it's like annoying to me. If you say, if, if you have a take a first look, then it really annoys me. Oh, I don't see delegate there, I don't see a method name, what is happening? So it's like uh, annoying, right? So it actually, it, if you ask me personally, it actually lacks some of the readability ways. A core readability is no more a, a concern in this case. I would say lambda expressions are just expressions we can write methods without name. Okay, but they are very, very strong in special cases when we see going forward. At this point, it might be ridiculous, but going forward when we see the uh, query expressions and the links, it's going to be really awesome. It's going to be really awesome. Okay, so now uh, coming back, uh, in this case, uh, there is no delegate keyword, but it actually inferred. So the type inference we have seen as a var keyword. The same thing is happening here behind the scene. Um, what's happening here is we have a type safe uh, delegate declared still, right? Your uh, sum action is a mapping, is of a type, right? It's mapping to the this, this, uh, this delegate, uh, which has a type which returns nothing and takes nothing. So it has uh, no parameters intake and it returns nothing. So uh, this uh, variable is actually of type some action delegate. And I'm just assigning some expression to it, the my lambda expression. And this expression should definitely uh, adhere to this delegate. In other words, it is just as good as uh, doing this. When I say is equal to delegate, in, in, the, in the previous case, we actually passed a method, right? A method that matches this signature. In the same case, here it's the same thing. The method is an anonymous method, and it's of course, uh, matches the signature. That means it takes no parameters here, and of course, it doesn't return anything. There is no return statement, right? And here also it's the same thing. So only thing is delegate keyboard is gone. It takes no parameters. So there's no name and no delegate keyword, but it takes, this is the parameter name, parameter set and the body. So any method will have two things, right? It has, uh, of course, three things. One is gone, which is name. Name is gone, um, but remaining two things are still there. The, those two things are parameters and the body. And if you see the parameter and body is still there when we talked about the anonymous methods. This is the parameter set. In this case, we have one parameter here, right? And this is the body, which starts with open brackets and close brackets, right? Now, it's more, it's more clear, right? So it, the, the method is still the way it is, only thing that its name is gone. That's the only difference. Uh, and in this case, the delegate keyword is gone. Otherwise, everything is remains the same. Uh, it has a parameters set. And this is a special operator, which will actually tie a meaning to this and this. Okay, so that's uh, a special operator, which will uh, tie a meaning between the set of parameters and the body. And the second case, uh, these are the set of parameters and this is the body. And this whole thing is tied up to be called as an expression, called a lambda expression. So this is how it is. And again, this is just similar to an anonymous method, which is a method again uh, without a name. Okay. In this case, we did not specify a delegate because this is again part of the type inference. Since this method matches the signature of this delegate, right? In this case, this delegate is actually uh, taking parameters, right? This, it's a, taking a one parameter and it returns nothing. And uh, similarly, this lambda expression is taking one parameter and returns nothing. So it's just writing a console statement, uh, but it's not returning any value out. Of course, we'll see some of the examples which can return something and takes more than one parameter and so on. Okay, so hope it is clear. It's not that uh, um, weird or complicated once you understand it. So only thing is that um, we just need to pay attention to the parts of the expression, then we should be good.
Okay, we'll see again the same thing. We'll see again in the next slide. In the, in this example, uh, its output is going to be same. You the way you invoke the delegate, you can actually use the uh, invoke statement to invoke delegate, or without invoke, uh, you can actually um, get rid of this part of the statement and then uh, open brackets at this point, and that's also fine. Uh, both ways you can actually invoke the delegate. Okay. Okay, we'll see this as a quick demo. We want to see this. Okay, cool. So this is the same piece of code uh, that we have just walked through uh, the slide. In the first case, this is using the anonymous method, wherein we see a delegate keyword and of course the parameter set and the body of the function. But uh, when we when we come to the lambda expression, uh, only thing new here is the new key uh, new operator, which is a lambda operator, and there is no delegate keyword, right? So delegate keyword is gone. So that's a slight difference if you see uh, when it comes to lambda. so it's more concise, right? It's like uh, you can just write a method on a fly. Uh, without really worrying about uh, delegate keyword at all. So delegate keyword is completely gone because it's inferred. So the value that you assigned to this variable um, based on the value that you're assigning, the conversion of this expression is done. Uh, the compiler is going to convert uh, your expression into a method and then matches that uh, method uh, to the uh, type that you have here. In this case, since this is a delegate, uh, it does apply all the rules that a delegate normally have. So if there is anything wrong with this, just in case uh, some action doesn't take any uh, parameters, what will happen if I, when it doesn't take uh, parameter, will it work? It doesn't work. So the still the delegate rules are still applied, right? Although I am not specifying that this is a delegate, the inference, uh, the type inference makes sure that the expression is uh, translated or converted and there are a set of uh, conversion rules applied to the expression. So there are, uh, and I'm not covering all of them. Uh, you can actually take a look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the lambda expression conversion con uh, constraints. Um, there, of course, the basic constraint is that, you know, the, uh, the, the method that you're going to specify here, the signature should definitely match with the delegate that you're using with. In this case, uh, some action uh, doesn't take any uh, parameters and also returns nothing. So it's a void, right? If you see, so that uh, your expression should match to that delegate signature. That's a fundamental thing. Although you're not actually specifying it explicitly. Okay, other than that, uh, the new thing here is the parameters on the left hand side and the body on the right hand side and both are uh, linked using the lambda exp um, lambda operator is equal to greater than. So that's the only new thing. So we, once we run this code, we'll see the same output uh, using the lambda expressions without parameters and with parameters, right? In this case, uh, uh, yes, without parameters and with parameters. In this case, they're using the uh, the console dot write line actually directly had that statement here hard coded, so it's just writing out. In the second case, uh, we invoke and then passing the parameter, right? Lambda using the parameter, so that's the difference. Different way we are actually making call of it. Otherwise, um, yeah, if you see the parameterized uh, delegate implementation, uh, it is taking one parameter here which is the same case here also using the anonymous methods and we are writing that out using the console write line. So this is just like a same thing, a method has a parameters and the method body. Okay, it's not that complicated if you take a close look. Okay, so that's all about the overview of um, uh, the lambda expressions. So these are a couple of other um, ways, a uh, couple of things that we need to be aware of uh, before we go forward with the lambda expression. So whatever we have seen is the basic form of it and uh, 
and uh, these are again basic forms of the lambda expressions because there is more to lambda expression going forward. Okay, so before we go further, uh, we just want to again walk through the same things. Here we compare with the syntax and the example with the comments. Okay, and especially in this slide, we are actually going to pay more attention to the uh, to the expression versus statement. Okay, the difference between an expression and a statement, number one, and also the difference between an implicitly implicit and explicit type, specifying the type explicitly and implicitly. If you take a look at this, it's very clear. The first example, uh, it's uh, very, very clear. If you see int x is it, um, like the lambda operator body. So this is the body of the function and this is the parameter of the function. Okay, so it's the same thing that function um, uh, parameters on the left hand side and the function body on the right hand side. Uh, but what special thing here is that um, the data type here we actually specified it as an explicitly. We specified the x data type explicitly in the first case. Okay, whereas in the second case it is further more concise, right? In this case x data type itself is not specified. So this is an implicit uh, types. Uh, this uh, if you will understand. Uh, it because of the variants, right? So the variant data type, the x val uh, data type is inferred based on the value that you're assigning to it. Okay, so that's uh, that's where if you take a close look at this um, expression, so this expression is always talking is talking about that you have one input parameter on the left hand side is a parameter list, and this parameter don't have a type because you have a type inference, right? And based on the value that you're returning out, its type is determined. So that's what it is. And uh, also the x plus one, right? X plus one is a body. In, in other words, um, if you start writing this as a function, right? How are you going to write? Uh, like say, I'll say function, just like a pseudocode, okay? Don't uh, uh, try to evaluate this as a um, uh, as a C sharp code, but this is just like a pseudo code. Uh, okay, let's put it a better. I'll say public. Uh, I'll write a C sharp code itself. Don't worry. Um, public, and I'll say uh, returns int. Okay, and say a na name. So this is a name method that I'm trying to write. Int uh, say. Uh, get something okay so or okay just some name and it, it's going to take int i okay sorry I think it's overlapping there but that's fine I hope you can understand what I'm trying to do okay and in this case I wanted to say written i I think we should have a clean uh, board, then only it will be really good. But anyway, that's fine. Okay, so this is what uh, we were actually trying to do, right? So it's a me uh, method, public int, uh, get int, and this is the parameters, right, int i. So here I specify in the first case, if you say int x, this is what int, uh, int x means, right, int i. So this is the parameter on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side is the body. The body is x plus 1. Okay, so here uh, we're just using the return keyword and say i plus 1. So that's the only difference. The return keyword is gone. Uh, if you see the uh, the brackets here, so brackets are also gone. No semicolon, nothing. It's simply i plus 1. Okay, it's more concise, right? So we have to write so much of uh, code just to build that method on the right-hand side. Lambda expression, you're actually specifying the same thing with just a uh, very plain uh, text. So as long as you understand what this means, you're actually good. So the left hand side is a parameter list. It's a list of parameters. Uh, if you have multiple parameters, then you can, you have, you have to, you have an example there. You have to just separate them with a comma. But in that case, the, para, uh, the, uh, the open brackets and close brackets are mandatory. So you can actually em uh, eliminate or, or, or omit the 
the brackets on the left hand side as long as uh, you have a, a single parameter. If you have no parameters or more than one parameter then you must always have the brackets on the left hand side. You cannot omit that. That's again a, a syntactical error you will see. Okay, this is the some of the comments uh, in this context, right? So if you see int x here, this is uh, data type is specified explicitly. So this is this is, uh, so x uh, data type is explicitly declared. That means you are already specifying that x is always going to be integer data type. You don't need to infer it or based on the value. And when you do it, it's going to ensure that you return uh, only int integer data type. So that's the difference between a var. So in this case, uh, if it is a, if it in this case, uh, the body will determine what is the value that you want to return out, whereas the uh, parameter won't determine. In this case, the parameter determines what the value the body should return. So that's the difference again uh, by explicitly specifying the data type and implicitly uh, inferring the data type. Okay, so that's a uh, clear distinction. And um, Yes, the body is written with an expression. So that's another key thing. So when I said this, right, without a written keyword, without any statement, right, this is an expression. The expression is, the expression uh, normally won't be like a normal C sharp code. Uh, in the second example, the same thing at the bottom. Here the data type is same. Uh, it's explicitly specified that it, X is going to be integer. But the body, if you take a look at the body, it has a statement. So this is a C sharp code like syntax, right? It's a plain C sharp code wherein you have the open brackets, uh, the close brackets, and within that you have a statement, which is a written X plus one. In the other example, we just use this. So when you see a C sharp like code as a body, then it's referred to as a statement. So normally the statements is what uh, we refer to as the code line, line of code that you write. And if you don't see this and you see only a, an expression, this is an expression that is always going to say that, okay, when I get X as some value, okay, so I'm going to return plus one, X plus one. If you, if you just uh, relate this to just a mathematical equation, right? Um, it's going to be pretty much like that, but you say you don't read this as an equal to, it's not equal to, but it is something else, it's an equation. Um, it's kind of, that's why it's called as an expression. So it doesn't have, a expression doesn't have a, a standard C-sharp code uh, added to it. And uh, whereas the statement will be a more like a C-sharp code wherein you have a curly bracelets open. There's just like a, uh, anonymous methods. Anonymous methods do have statements, but they don't have expressions. So that's why uh, the anonymous uh, methods and lambda expressions. So expression versus statement or a method. This is dif difference the name itself. So lambda expressions are more expressive. Uh, that's why it's called a functional programming. So functional programming, if you see, they are, will be more functionally expressive than like a mathematics uh, by, uh, in the form of equations. And you can just write methods uh, forming some equations. Uh, but you know, it might give you a code readability will go for a toss definitely unless you really uh, since this is a very small example it's fine if you're writing a very lengthy program using x plus y y plus two three and four uh, then whoever is going to read is going to die uh, that's my personal opinion but uh, again so definitely uh, you will not be writing such kind of code uh, but it's always going to be very concise wherever you're going to make use of it uh, the, the the best way to uh, the best usage wise uh, we'll see when we really make uh, a simple usage but it's going to be very powerful uh, like things like you want to sort something or uh, things like you want to filter uh, data or get a subset of a data from a different uh, collection you have to write a lengthy code for that you cannot you can do a very simple logic using the lambda expressions and uh, get it done so it's very powerful though. Okay, so you don't look at um, writing a very big program using the lambda expressions because that's going to be not a useful way at all. Lambda expressions are going to be used wherever uh, it's going to be a very concise and meaningful and definitely when you see the link it's very very uh, uh, 
user readable code and uh, rather than uh, not understandable code uh, and it all depends how you make use of it so you don't kill yourself by writing a very complicated algorithm uh, using an expression right uh, down the line you will not understand what you have written although it might work okay so readability is again one major thing that you need to be really uh, worried about because uh, today you might write a complex code and tomorrow when you see the, your code uh, after a year or two years then you might not understand what you have written that day and same thing will happen to someone who will maintain your code uh, although if you are capable of writing a complex code it's good but try to avoid okay so the, um, so we have seen two things one is the implicitly typing uh, implicitly uh, uh, making the uh, type inference and the explicitly specifying the data type and also the statement the body can have a statement or an expression okay so at, the, at every instance if you see the operator doesn't change the operator is a signature there um, so the lambda operator so whenever you see this operator I think I have seen a couple of uh, basic questions people will, will ask you will uh, like uh, object uh, objective questions uh, they will simply ask you couple, they'll give you four code examples and they'll say which one of these represent a lambda expression simple question the best thing is look at the operator you don't have to really break your head then uh, is it an anonymous method or, or it's an uh, lambda expression or a query expression or what it doesn't matter all you need to know is this operator as long as you remember the operator you know lambda expression right so that's a very simple thing on left hand side you have parameters set on the right hand side is the body no matter how it is it could be an expression it could be a statement um, that's how it is and this third case if you see uh, you have multiple parameters whereas int x and int y uh, uh, Int x and int y is a multiple parameters. In case of multiple parameters, you cannot omit the brackets on the left hand side. Whereas when you have a single parameter on the left hand side, you can omit um, that too when you, when it is uh, not a when you're making as an implicit one. When you make an explicit one again, you need to uh, be in the brackets. And if you don't have any parameters that time also you cannot omit the brackets so brackets can be omitted on the left hand side uh, only for a single parameter okay for multiple parameters again you need to have it of course it does make sense right um, to have it and uh, return again here in this case when you say return and then this is a statement equations can be very simple as this one right if you say also oh, uh, how does the method uh, body implemented is it using an expression or a method or a statement now in this case it is actually using a statement because it's a C sharp syntax right it's a open brackets close brackets a written keyword and then it's a standard statements um, and whereas uh, uh, when we see this uh, x into y this is an expression right just like an equation so x comma y implies uh, or lambda operator x into y so what this indicates that the method receives x and y as a parameter and what you're returning out you're returning a x into y as simple as that so you can read the lambda expressions in that way uh, and when it is statement it might be a little more uh, readable right because you can clearly say that okay i'm getting int x and int y and what i'm returning you have a written keyword here so it's always says that it's written x and y it's very uh, little uh, readable whereas when you come to the expression you need to read in a specific way when I say on the left hand side it's a parameter on the right hand side is a body it receives x and y as a parameters and x into y is what written out of course the bottom line here is that all of these need to be associated to a delegate instance of course none of these can exist on their own if you see the previous uh, slide all of these expressions were actually uh, associated to a delegate right that's how you can make use of them otherwise if you write a, uh, a expression like this in air it doesn't do anything someone have to invoke it and who invokes it the delegates will invoke it and the delegate delegates should match to the method signature again so that again remains same so nothing else will change and the last one here is the um, 
method without any parameters, uh, without any parameters. But in the first case, it's an expression. Oops. In expression, it cannot, it need not be always an x and y, but it can be a, sta uh, a statement like uh, calling a method uh, or instance method um, and the pass a parameter. You can just straight away call a method uh, a statement like this. Uh, you specify it is a statement only when you see these brackets, the the curly bracelets. Whenever you see the curly bracelets, then the content within it becomes a statement. Okay. Otherwise, uh, um, this is a uh, expression in the first place. The second case is a statement. Okay. So that's all uh, the different flavors of uh, expression versus statement and the implicit data types versus explicit data types all about. And uh, we'll see a quick demo of this here. So we're going to take this piece of code which we have already walked through. And we'll see this uh, demo. Well, nothing but I'm just making a call. Of course, I need to uncomment. This class implementation, which has all the flavors that we have seen so far. Okay, so in this case, if you see uh, those expressions, so we're actually associating to the respect of delegates, right? And I have a list of these delegates declared on the top. Okay, so I'm not going to focus, uh, show you uh, the delegate signatures uh, later stage. This is the first place I'm going to show you. So uh, this delegate, one of the delegate is, have, is returning an integer, taking an integer, right? And the other delegate is again returning an integer and is taking two integers as a parameters. And another one, uh, two of those other things which we have already seen, uh, returns nothing, but one takes no parameter, another one takes one string parameter. So those are different flavors of the delegate implementation. And bottom, we have different ways of uh, uh, implementing those uh, delegates. Uh, one using the uh, implicit, or uh, uh, x is an implicit data type, and uh, which is referred to as an int at runtime, uh, since it is plus one, and one makes the uh, inference, type inference. Uh, and the, on the right hand side, if you see uh, the right hand side, we have uh, the expression. So this is an expression, and in the in this case, uh, it's an explicitly typed uh, uh, data type is referred. And on the right hand side, it's uh, the body is implemented using expression. That's why the name of these um, instances are named specifically, so that whenever you read this code out. Uh, you read out based on the name that you have. In this case, obviously, implicitly, uh, implicitly typed um, data type and the body's uh, expression, expression body. On the second case, it is explicitly typed data type and the the body is expression, not a statement. In the second case, it's uh, implicitly defined data type. X is an implicit and uh, statement. Uh, the body is a statement. Right, because you see the curly bracelets on the right hand side, so on the left hand side, and written statement. So, uh, so that's all the different flavors um, in this case. Uh, similarly, with the explicit statement body, and uh, that means explicitly specifying the data type, and also the statement body. So that's all. And yes, it's the same thing that we have uh, discussed, uh, seen in the slide. So we're just going to uh, kick it off. And in this case, if you notice it, how I'm invoking the Oh, the delegates. So in this case, of course, I have the delegate <coughs> instance created and then associated this uh, method or expression in this case, lambda expression as a method to the body. So it's very, very concise, right? Just a matter of a single line. And uh, how I'm invoking it, I'm invoking it using the instance, right? This is the instance and with I can actually make use of dot invoke or just pass it directly like this. Either way, it's fine. So in the earlier examples, we have used the dot invoke. Uh, in this case, we're just calling it directly just like a local method. Okay, so that's how we, we are invoking the delegate in this example. And we'll see the output. No errors, it works good. And if you see the expression, it really works good. And the in the code example, if you see, if you map the output, 
in the first case uh, we passed 10 as a parameter and we got 11 because the expression is x plus 1 so x is replaced uh, with 10 when when you when I passed it so then it, um, it written 10, 10 plus 1 so that's what happened 11 and uh, same thing of course uh, with the rest all all doing the same thing only thing is that we are writing it in different ways okay so and uh, multiplication here 10 into 20 is what happened uh, with this expression whereas x comma y and uh, x into y okay so x into y is what written out as a 200 and uh, that's what uh, I captured and uh, written out the console so in this case the console right line is actually doing that we just uh, I just put this statement and then uh, the placeholder to uh, write the value out it's again so I'm just making invoking the delegate and when I invoke this delegate <clears throat> what's going to happen so it's here itself and this is the expression so how do you debug such things let's try to debug what will happen let, let us try to do a debug and see what's happening uh, I'll hit F11 okay so it went into the body and uh, I can see X as 10 and I can see Y as 20 and of course these are the parameters that are received in so if I have multiple statements then definitely the debugger will stop at uh, that respect to line so if you see the debugger is again smart enough it is highlighting the yellow portion of that statement uh, the yellow portion is the line statement that it is right now debugging right so it's as a, it's treated as a separate line although whole thing is at the same line and I'm hitting F10 and it's good so debugger works pretty good so no issues with that if you have multiple lines there it's good to go okay so hope you like the lambda expressions and um, we'll see a real usage real-time usage how are you going to make use of the one of the uh, very basic example here okay uh, this example uh, in this example what we're doing we actually have a list uh, which is a generic uh, list of integers it is generic and if you remember if you hope you recollect what is system dot collections dot generic uh, this is not a list from system dot collections it is a list from generic namespace that means this is a generic list and it takes int as a type uh, hope you remember what is a generic generics are again uh, generic types which uh, are which are the examples for a parametric polymorphism wherein the the instance uh, of the respective classes generic classes will represent the data type uh, that it is initialized with so in this case the numbers will be the list of collections for integer data type only so it's a type safe collection in other words, so generics are, and if someone asks you what is generics, and you can straight away say that, that uh, generics are, uh, are type safe collections. In other words, so a list is an example in this case, in this example we are making use of it. So in, the, in this example what I am having is uh, a set of numbers 1 to 7 and what I am trying to do is uh, trying to filter the content of the collection to form two separate uh, uh, arrays one is uh, with even numbers and other one is odd numbers I'm actually filtering them out to two different arrays how do uh, if we at all you have to write a code like this what you will do normally if you um, you will have to have a create a, a local array and then loop through the items and see if evaluate each of the members saying whether it is a uh, uh, even number or odd number and if it is an even number then add that number to an even collection and then if it is an odd number then add it to a uh, uh, odd number collection and then finally you will have at the end you will have the uh, even number collection and odd number collection so that's kind of iteration using a for each loop in this case using a lambda expression how simple it is it's a, just a single line statement wherein we are making use of the find all again how did you get this find all is, is a question right so this is um, available as part of the I queryable interface so we, which we will see in the in the later session when we go more uh, 
deep into the lambdas and their implementation wise there are a couple of uh, standard um, uh, delegates so far we have seen the uh, delegate signature on top of our classes right and going forward we will not see that also so uh, there are uh, standard specific implicit delegates uh, declared uh, in the language itself for a uh, common usages uh, in this case if you see uh, where is the delegate do you see delegate here nowhere right so, so, so without a delegate how I'm doing this so that's what uh, going forward we will not see uh, a delegate declaration also because they will be implicitly available as part of the uh, uh, members in this case uh, uh, the generic list has a special interface which will have a delegates again so as I mentioned delegates in uh, delegates are function pointers at the at the bottom line definition but they are completely object oriented that means in this case we are actually making use of a delegate as part of an interface that's how it is that it's uh, that's the power of the dotnet language versus any others uh, in in C++ uh, although a pointer refers to an address it is just an ad pointer to an address it is nothing more than that uh, you cannot have a pointer as an object oriented um, uh, class it's not in C sharp or in .NET it is so delegate although it is just a function pointer mapping to a method it is completely object oriented and that's that's what the output we are looking at here uh, since the list uh, generic list implements the respective interface which has uh, uh, methods available which takes a, a delegate in this case find all uh, takes a delegate as a parameter uh, and that delegate has a standard signature wherein which which is what we are actually specifying it here now, on the left hand side is the parameter and it takes one parameter because it's a type it friends we didn't specify the what's the type and on the right hand side is the body so this is the body what it is doing n modulus 2 is equal to 0 it's actually returning a state, returning a value whether this is equal or not. If you look at this carefully, that means if you divide the uh, number n by 2 and the remainder is equal to 0, that means it, if it is 0, then it is returning a true. That means a Boolean statement. Boolean. It is written, it is taking a number as an input and returning a Boolean as an output. So that's the signature if you, signature of the delegate uh, that we are referring to got it so again if you take one step back here what this find all as a name implies as a name implies find all again find all what find all this which which uh, satisfies uh, this condition which is true okay find all the elements inside my numbers inside my numbers list Oops. So I'm just reading on from uh, right hand to left hand side. Okay, so what I'm saying is find all elements which matches this condition. That means whichever um, number divides by two and the uh, and the the remainder is zero uh, is true. Get me all those numbers. That means in, that, in other words, I'm just giving an expression saying that find me the even numbers. That's what we need, right? So I'm getting the even numbers out. So what it, what this find all is going to do is going to iterate through the entire list, evaluate uh, this expression on the each and every item in that list, and then get me the gets returns the value out as now this is a var. I don't know what. Uh, data type it's going to be uh, at the end right so it's all based on the find all what find all returns find all returns another list of integers which is even so at the end of uh, this evaluation you will see events uh, variable becoming a list of integers okay so that's the lambda expression usage wise if you see how concise your filter criteria is gone and if you imagine what you can do uh, it's uh, it's like endless you can do so many things uh, and this is how the link is uh, 
becoming more more and more and more useful. So imagine the same way you can actually filter out uh, content of a table or, or a collection that you retrieve from a database. To filter a content you don't have to write a big logic and also you don't have to go and execute that statement at database side to gain the database because if you say select where clause and all you have to put in the query select statement and then execute at the database side and then bring that filter output right that's what you, we used to do normally. Uh, now once you get the whole result set out you can apply any algorithm that you like as a delegate as a, an expression so that's why it's called an expression uh, and then apply that expression on the data you will get whatever you want and there is no limit to it. But of course there are limitations to it, um, but like if you have a very large uh, volume of data, again um, link is not recommended. So if you have a very large volume of data, like it has millions of millions of rows, then again link is going to die. Uh, but again in 4.0, um, it's not the end again, 4.0, there is an answer for that also, which is called a parallel link, uh, wherein it make you make use of the your core processors uh, and make a parallel link which that means if you have a million or two million records uh, that you want to process using link you can still do it at the split of a second it's more much faster and um, performance wise it's uh, out, out, outnumbered uh, in the, in, with the parallel link and we'll see probably parallel link is out of scope for us so we, I will not cover that but it's all up to your interest okay and in this case we are using the um, reading through the numbers um, using the for each statement and imagine whenever you say for each that means this uh, numbers need to implement the I which one which interface if you can answer it uh, it will be great uh, if not, it's fine. It must implement the I enumerable, right? We did see the I enumerable interface wherein it has a get enumerator. We did see the implementation of a get enumerator will return a class which implements the I enumerator interface. So, so all that is there within this single statement for each statement. Okay, so we really don't want to get into that level at this point. Uh, at this point, we just want to read the contents of the numbers, which is the original numbers out. And in the second uh, iteration, we are reading the e what is the content of the events and what is the contents of the odd. And uh, if I run this, what I'll see, I'll see what I want. So in the first case, all the numbers as is in this even numbers, you see two, four, six, all even numbers, good. And the odd numbers, all the odd numbers, which is perfectly fine. Right, so we'll just run this uh, demo. Okay, so I can still keep this uh, without commenting out. Okay, so this is the core example that I wanted to show. This is just one of the example that I just uh, um, made available here uh, and this is a starting point. We haven't seen the link yet. So link is completely uh, different to what we have done so far. Um, although we can make use of link again in a very very useful way in different way which is again more user friendly uh, way it's, it's not going to be like this definitely it's going to be a little more interesting okay so in this case um, okay so we'll take uh, the this statement out and we're going to make use of this statement for now Okay, so the output is uh, completely even numbers and odd numbers, or numbers, and the code that we have uh, seen here is just this one. If you run this, what will happen if I do F11? Can I see how it is doing? Yes, I can step into and see. If you see that, each of the numbers, num n is fine now, and n divided by uh, what will this evaluate to? Right click and say quick watch, it evaluates to false, right? I can actually add this as a add to watch, okay? So this is the best way I can actually uh, walk through the items and pay a close attention to the watch window. Um, and also I can add N to this watch window so that I can 
C and also N modulus 2 so that I can see what is the output right if you want to really debug uh, such operations you can actually really make use of the watch window um, and uh, hit F10 you will see on the bottom most uh, the values got changed uh, in this case we have uh, 6 n as 6 and n modulus uh, 2 as 0 and the expression n mod 2 is evaluated to true right so this is an even number so that's what the expression is doing and also again f10 and if you see it now it is n is 7 and n mod 2 is 1 so it's not equal to 0 so it evaluated to false and whichever is evaluated to true uh, is added to even numbers and now what will happen to the odd numbers oops I think I didn't, I didn't uh, hit the F11 so it just passed through I hope you can uh, do it uh, at your end and see how it is working okay so that's how uh, we're getting the even numbers out and odd numbers out using the lum lambda expression the, this is a lambda expression we have and find all is a find all let's see what's the signature of the find if you see the, if you take a close look of, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I can't actually zoom it out, but if you see it is taking as system dot predicate as a delegate of t. If a t is a delegate, so t is an expression that you can pass in, uh, and that can be of a type, and uh, it can take uh, predicate. It takes int as an input and a match. A match is actually a boolean, right? Uh, it normally matches to a boolean for that and uh, that's how the find all is actually referring to a delegate. It's a generic delegate which is called system.predicate of t. t is a type parameter and type parameter in this case is an expression that we're passing in. Okay? That's, uh, that's what we have for today. So in this session 21, we did walk through uh, the C Sharp 3.0 features um, and we did see the uh, implicitly typed local variables uh, are following the overview. What are the other restrictions apply with the type inference, uh, especially with the implicitly typed local variables with the var keyword. And we did see an extension methods, which is a very powerful feature. Down the line, we'll see the uh, power of uh, the extension features when we go into the link uh, namespace, system.link namespace. Uh, and we did see the lambda expressions uh, as a starting point and we did walk through the very detail uh, into the lambda expressions and also having uh, uh, different uh, ways of defining the lambda expressions with the expl explicitly declaring the uh, body as well as the, uh, writing the body with an expression. Uh, all those different uh, uh, scenarios we did see with the parameters, without parameters, how can we declare uh, all that we did see today and uh, with a very good example uh, in real time usage, usage wise we did see a very good example of having even numbers and odd numbers and then we'll continue with the next session uh, with further details into lambda expressions uh, uh, starting with the generic delegates uh, that were introduced in 3.5 uh, uh, framework. Okay, so let's continue with the next session.